Okay. What about the relation between the change in the momentum and the second Newton's second law? Or do we have any relation between them? Remember, the Newton's second law is about the forces acting on an object and its acceleration and its mass. And the total forces acting on an object uh, is uh, mass times its acceleration. But the thing is, if you, if you uh, use the definition of the acceleration in this equation, what is the acceleration? It's the change in the velocity divided by the time that this change happens, right? Delta V divided by delta T. But if you observe that if you multiply M by delta V divided by delta T, you, you will observe that the nominator of this M times delta V is nothing but the change in the moment, right? Because delta V is V final minus V initial, and if you multiply this by M, what you do is P final minus P initial, and this is the change in the momentum. So it appears that the Newton's second law okay, is, can be expressed as the change in the momentum, delta P, divided by delta T. The total force acting on the object or the system is equal to the change in the momentum divided by delta T. So this is the Newton's second law expressed in terms of the change in the momentum. Uh, remember, uh, I have defined this equilibrium state of the systems or of the, of the object as the total forces acting on the object, if the total forces acting on the object is zero, that means that the uh, system is in equilibrium. Uh, you can interpret this uh, in terms of the momentum change. If the system has no change in its momentum, then that means the system is in equilibrium. Or if there is no change of the momentum of the system or of the object, that means there is no any net force acting on the object. The total force is zero. So this is the uh, one nice relation that we will all the time use. Uh, the relation between the Newton's second law, the forces acting on the system, and the change in the momentum. Next, I define even more useful expression, more useful physical quantity, which is called impulse. And it's a vector. The impulse is multiplying the forces acting on an object or a system by the time delta t that this force acting on the object, the duration of that this force acting on the object. So f times delta t is defined to be the impulse acting on the system or on the object. But if you use the force as delta p times delta t, right? Remember from the uh, previous uh, case, the force was equal to the change in the momentum divided by delta t, right? This change, the duration of that change. If you multiply this force by delta t, well, what you obtain is the impulse is nothing but the change in the momentum. So if you define the impulse as the force, the average force on the object times that this average force, uh, duration of this average force acting on the object, it is nothing but the change of the momentum of that object, okay? And the impulse has the same unit with that of momentum because it is the change in the momentum, kilogram per meter second. And impulse is a vector also, and it, this vector has the same direction as the change of the momentum. Not the momentum itself, but the change of the momentum uh, defines the direction of the impulse on the object. Okay. So in this example, what you see is there's a baseball coming to the player, and the player hits this baseball by is a baseball bat. Baseball, suppose. Uh, baseball bat 
hits the object, the ball, and it's changed its direction of motion. Okay? And in fact, what the ball has during this impact is nothing but an impulse, right? So the impulse is this time. What do you associate associated? Uh, what do you think about the associated force with this impulse? Because the uh, the ball changes its momentum. That means there is an impulse on the ball. What about the force? The force is provided by the baseball bat. Right? The baseball bat hits the ball. This hitting happens for some time. It has some duration. Might be a ten of a second, right? Uh, if it hits very hard, and if the ball and the bat is very hard material, then this impact time is very small, delta t. But you can always calculate the force that uh, this bat applies on the ball just by uh, by uh, observing the time of impact. If you say that this impact happens in 0.1 seconds, one tenth of a second, just by calculating the momentum change of the ball, you can calculate the average force. Because the momentum, once you know the momentum change and once you know delta t, you can find the force on the object. Okay? If this duration impact is taking a longer time, let's say 0 0.5, half of a second, the same momentum, the same change in the momentum, but this time the force acting on the object will be smaller. You can, uh, you can change uh, the impact time, you can decrease the impact time, but if you decrease the impact time, if you keep the momentum change the same, you must increase the force. If you increase the impact time, if you conserve the same change in the momentum, then the force must be decreased. Okay? So, uh, this is best explained in crushing an egg on the surface. If you have an egg, you leave it, you release it, it uh, hits the ground. Uh, if the ground is hard enough, right, the egg will crash. The egg will, the egg will be destroyed. But if you release the egg, it hits the uh, surface, which has this time a softer material, like a sponge, singer, then the change in the momentum will be the same, right? Because from a distance, the same height, this distance, the egg will have the same velocity, the impact velocity, because the distances are the same. But since the, this change in its velocity happens uh, taking a longer time, if, you, if the heat uh, of the egg onto a sponge, not a hard material, the surface itself, but a sponge, because the sponge is a soft material and the impact time is larger than that of a hard surface, right? But the change in the momentum is the same in both cases. Uh, momentum change is the same, but delta is larger than the hard surface. That means F, the force on the egg, is smaller. Since you have a smaller force on the egg, egg may not be broken this time if you fall if you release the uh, egg onto a soft surface like a sponge uh, in fact I had uh, a ball is thrown to a wall and it uh, before the ball hitting the uh, wall 
it has a velocity of uh, minus 30 meter per second. Why minus? Because it's going on the <laughs> negative x direction. And the mass of the ball is given 0 0.4 kilograms. And after hitting the ball, the ball rebounds back from the wall with a velocity of 20 meter per second. So the question is, what is the impulse of the net force on the ball during this collision uh, if, well, the collision time is not given. You don't need, in fact, the collision time. Uh, uh, you don't no need to know also the uh, force, the average force. But just by calculating the change in the momentum of the ball, you can calculate the uh, impulse on the ball. Anybody calculated? 12? 20. So let's write impulse from the definition. The in final momentum minus the initial momentum, right? You can see. Uh, the final momentum is the mass times velocity. And since the velocity is plus, the mass is 0 0.4. It is 0 0.4 times 28, right? The final momentum is 8 kilogram meter per second. I'm just omitting Minus. the unit. Minus the initial momentum. Since the velocity is in negative direction, minus, minus 30 times 0 0.4, which is minus 12, right? And if you subtract this, 2 minuses makes it plus 20 kilogram meter per second. So this is the impulse on the ball. Well, the next question is, if that collision happens to be in 0 0.1 second, what is the average force on the ball during this impact with the ball? So this time, you will use the impulse, the another formula. The impulse was also equal to the average force times delta t, right? And impulse is happened to be 20. And this is replaced, delta t is replaced by 0 0.1, right? And the impulse is provided by the force, the reaction force of the wall on the ball of 20, uh, 200 newtons, right? So it's huge. The force... The force, the direction of the force, is a nice question, on the ball must be toward right because uh, the ball changes its direction toward right. I can also ask you this question. What is the force uh, exerted by the ball on the ball? The ball also will right, see a force applied by the ball. What this force will be? The same force. It's the minus same force. Minus right? Action, reaction. Remember uh, Newton's third law? If some object uh, applies a force on the other object, the same force will be applied uh, in reverse. So the wall also uh, uh, see the same force, but the force this time on the wall is in the opposite direction. Uh, right? So as you see, if this impact time, 0 0.1 seconds, happens to be uh, 0 0.01 seconds, even one tenth of it, the force will be two tons, right? That's now you appreciate why the boxers uh, punches, right? Uh, the other guy wants to punch the other guy in a very short time. Another uh, nice question. You are testing a new car using a crash test dummies. I don't know what this is, but what the guy does, uh, 
crashing the car onto wall. Consider two ways to slow down the car from uh, 90 uh, kilometers per hour to a complete stop. You let the car, car uh, slam into the wall. You crash the car into the wall and bringing it to a sudden stop. In the second case, you let the car plow into a giant tub of gelatin so that it comes to a gradual head. That means you are crashing the car to a soft, softer wall. There are many uh, uh, soft materials between the wall and the car, so the car comes to a slowly uh, stop. In which case, these two cases, in which case is there a greater impulse of the net force on the car? Case one. Who says the same? Who says the case two? Who says the impulses are the same for both cases? Same. Why? Okay, I'm asking why. Arkadaşlar biraz sefere ya dersin başında girmeyin ya da böyle ortalıkta yani hoş olmuyor pek bence. Şimdi çıkabilirsiniz. Bir dahaki sefere yalnız. Evet. Why do we have the same impulse? In in both cases why do we have the same impulse? Well, initial velocities, initial velocities are the same, right? 90 kilometers. And the final velocity is zero for both cases. So the change in the momentum in both cases is the same. That's that's why we have the same impulse because the impulse is nothing but the change in the momentum. In both cases, we have the same change in the momentum. But you can tell that the first one is very dangerous if you are inside the car. Right? Uh, why? Because in the first case, the impact time is very small. To make the same change in the momentum, the force must be large. That's why in car crashes, the cars uh, get very uh, harmful uh, change in their shapes, or also to the uh, uh, people inside. Uh, so, since the, during the collisions, uh, the cars comes to a stop in a very short time, right? Because initially they have large momentum, but they come to a, a stop in a very short time. That means the average force on the car will be very large. And this large force is deadly. So, it changes the... Uh, crushes the car into small pieces or all, or uh, change the shape like anything else. Okay, so in the first case, the force will be very large in compared to the second case, but the change in the, imp the, the impulse is the same for both cases. So what is about this conservation law in, for the momentum? Remember, uh, as I said, if there are no net force acting on an object, right, uh, then the, the object is said to be in equilibrium. There is no force on it. But since the force is expressed as the change in the momentum divided by delta t, if there is no net force on the object, that means this ratio is equal to zero, right? If this ratio is equal to zero, that means delta p is equal to zero, right? If delta p is equal to zero, the final momentum must be equal to the initial momentum because delta p is p final minus p initial, okay? Well, <coughs> that means the momentum is conserved. If the initial momentum value is the same with the final or the final momentum value is the same with the initial value, then the momentum does not change at all, the, it is conserved. So you can, uh, you can imagine such a case that two objects are thrown 
to each other so that they collide and after the collision they go in opposite directions is momentum conserved the total momentum is is the total momentum conserved during this collision if you look at this case in the uh, window of only one object then of course there is some kind of forces acting on but if you think that these two objects are the same system okay they have some kind of internal forces on each other right once one of the object hits onto other let's the first one the first one will experience a very large force whatever it depends on the uh, uh, value of the initial moment it will experience a very large force on it but the same force will be experienced experienced by the other object the second one but that force will be exactly in the opposite direction with the first one if this first one sees a force on this direction the other one will see a force exactly the same magnitude but in the opposite direction what about the sum of these reaction action forces it is zero right this forces are equal to zero that means even before they collide if there is there are no forces on the object even right at the collision the total force on the two objects again is equal to zero and after the collision again there are no no any forces that means this collision during this collision the total of the momentum for both 1 and 2 does not change because there are no forces net forces on the system of two objects not only one but the total total forces on both objects external forces there are no any external forces all forces during this collision happens because of their reaction action uh, uh, type of forces between these two objects okay so <coughs> we will uh, clarify this by thinking the examples that but for the time being as I said usually in this chapter as a, syst a system uh, consists of more than one particle okay a system we will take usually two objects and if there are no external force forces on the objects that means the momentum will be conserved on these objects okay think of this example okay this makes everything more clear to you two uh, boats or two canoes uh, they are filled with uh, one is two people the other is four people and on the surface of water they come to a close uh, touch and they just uh, pushes themselves okay from each other they pushes themselves from the other with a force of 46 newtons but we know if one pushes with a 46 newtons the other pushes with the same force in the opposite direction because of the action reaction uh, law so what can you say about the total change in the momentum of these two cones imagine um, well you can think that there is no any frictional friction between the cone and the surface of water uh, what can you say about the total change in the momentum of these two initially initially you can uh, think that they are not moving okay they are just touching themselves and they are not moving if you write down the total momentum for both conos it is zero because they have zero velocities they are next to each other they have zero velocities so initial momentum is for both of them is zero once they push themselves right they will obtain some kind of velocities one will be the toward left the other cono uh, will move toward right but even if you cannot say what the velocities of these canons 
you can say that their total momentum will be equal to zero. Because there is no any external force acting on this corner. The all forces are because of themselves, action reaction force pairs. And these forces, when you sum up, is equal to zero because they have the same magnitude in the opposite directions. Uh, even you cannot determine its specific velocities, but you can say the total of their momentums after this push will be equal to zero. One is going with one direction and in the negative x direction, and the other will go in the positive x direction. Their momentums, the sum of their momentums, will be zero. So for this fact, let's think of this question that a three kilogram rifle gun, uh, Tufek rifle, fires a very small bullet. Of course, bullet has a relatively a small mass in compared to the rifle. It is 0 0.005 kilograms, uh, 5 grams. At a speed of 300 meters per second, this is the typical speed of a, a bullet from a rifle. Which force is greater in magnitude? A, in the first case, the force that the rifle exerts on the bullet or the force that the bullet exerts on the rifle. Okay. What's your answer? Well, if you fire a rifle, you will, you will, anybody has shot a rifle? To fake that ship on one? Yes, Silala. Anyway, you you have seen the movies, right? You have seen the movies. A gun is uh, shot by a man, and you observe kind of push back on the guy that shoots the gun. So that's because there will be a force on the rifle because of the shot, or because of the very high speed of the bullet, because it moves in this direction, and because of this motion. Uh, there will be a force acting on the rifle in the opposite direction. So which force is larger? Or what do you say? The, uh, the, the bullet applies a force on the rifle is larger or the rifle applies a force on the bullet because there must be a very large force so that the uh, bullet moves very High speeds. Well, obviously there is some kind of uh, explosion inside the rifle, but we are we care about the force as a result of this. Okay. You can say this is ex explosion. Explosion. What? What the, exp uh, the explosion forces on the rifle, or or on the bullet? Which one is the larger? A says the force that the rifle exerts on the bullet is large, or the force that the bullet exerts on the rifle is large. Both forces have the same magnitude, or you cannot say anything about it, because there is not enough information. Both forces are the same. Why? You can think in terms of the uh, change in something. Change in momentum of what? Rifle or bullet? Both. What is the change in the momentum? Bullet's change in momentum is greater than rifle, but rifle is heavier. I mean, the total. Obviously, the, the bullet is moving, let's say, in, in one direction, but the rifle will go in the opposite direction. What can you say about the change in total of their momentums? One has a plus momentum, the other is a minus momentum. What? Zero. Why? Why do we have a zero momentum after the uh, shutting the uh, rifle? Because initially they have zero momentum. Before you trigger the Trigger, okay? What is the total momentum of the bullet and the rifle system? 
they stay at rest, zero. What happens you uh, do the trigger? And some kind of explosion inside, right? This exerts a force on the bullet and on the rifle, but the force on one of them is equal to the magnitude in other because there is no change in the momentum, right? Since the bullet has a very, very small mass in compared to the uh, rifle, right? But they have the same momentum, right? Uh, the rifle has the same momentum as that of the bullet, but the bullet has a very small mass, so it must have a very large velocity in compared to the rifle, right? So as the total of their momentum is zero. That means the force on the bullet and the rifle is the same, but since the rifle has a larger mass, the motion of the rifle will be, le uh, will be smaller, or the velocity of the rifle will be smaller in compared to the bullet. Which of them is the Z? Both forces have the same magnitude, C. I, I'm confused that because when the rifle is um, pushed at the bullet, so the force comes uh, greater. OK, think this. Uh, you have the same. Assume that they have the same force. The rifle uh, uh, gives the same force on, on the bullet, and the bullet gives the same force because of the action reaction, right? So the force is the same. Uh, the same force will accelerate the smaller mass, a larger acceleration, because the mass is very small, right? If you write down the F, M times A, the force is the same. Mass of the bullet is very small, so acceleration of the bullet will be very large because mass for the bullet is small. The force for both bullet and the rifle is the same. You accept this, right? Yes, sir. Because there is no change in the momentum. Yeah. But the force, the same force on the bullet, provides the bullet very large acceleration because its mass is very small in compared to the rifle. So it reaches very, very high speed. Okay? But the rifle has a large mass, even the same force for the rifle, it has a large mass, its acceleration will be small in compared to the bullet. Okay? All right. This is confusing, I know, but this is the explanation that goes. All right, so uh, the best uh, nice application of the conservation of momentum is collisions. Uh, and there are different types of collisions, okay? When two objects collide, Sometimes you see that after the collision, two objects move with the same velocity. They move together. Sometimes after the collision, the objects will move uh, separately, okay, in different directions. So with this, we classify the collisions into two uh, groups. One is elastic collisions and the other is inelastic collisions. We start with the inelastic collisions. In the inelastic collisions, if the collision is completely inelastic, okay, if the collision is completely inelastic, the two objects after the collision stick, okay? They glue onto each other and they move together with the same velocity. So this is completely inelastic collisions. But uh, even it is a Inelastic or elastic, the momentum for both type of collisions, for all kinds of collisions, the momentum is always conserved. Okay? Because the forces acting on the objects, on each other, always, they have the same magnitude, even if it is uh, elastic or inelastic. The force, since the forces are the same, since total of all forces are equal to zero, the momentum is always conserved for 
all kinds of collagens, either inelastic or elastic. For inelastic collagens, uh, let me uh, classify. Let me uh, let me uh, write down if the collagen takes in in one dimension uh, the total of initial momentum. Okay, so we we care about the sum of the momentums of both objects before the collision, since. The object moves with different velocities. We find first the total initial momentum. The total initial momentum is the sum of the uh, first object, uh, the mass of the first object times its velocity, initial velocity, and the mass of the se uh, second object times its initial velocity. If this collision is taking uh, place in one dimension, then the negative velocities are the velocities that are going in the negative x direction. The positive velocities are taken as the velocities in going in the positive x direction. But we know, one thing we know, that after the collision, two objects, M1 and M2, stick and they move together. So their final velocities will be the same. When you write down the final momentum, you write the objects like having one mass, M1 plus M2, because they stick and move together with the same velocity. It's final. So the question is finding this final velocity. How can you find the final velocity? Since the momentums are conserved, Pi is equal to P final. When you equate these two, and when you solve for V final, that's what you find. This total momentum divided by the total mass of these two objects. This will give you the final velocity after the collision. <clears throat> well, for example, in this example, you have two wagons. Uh, they are colliding each other, but one of them is staying at rest. So the total momentum is just m times if you assume that both has the same mass. They have the same mass. Uh, one is coming with some velocity v0 initial and hitting the other one which is staying at rest. So you can exactly write the total momentum, initial momentum as uh, m times v0, right? In terms of the masses of the wagon and the initial velocity. What happens after the collision? Obviously after the collision, Two wagons, they are stick together. This is the condition. And what will be the final velocity of both wagons then? What you do is, the final momentum, P final, will be equal to 2M times V final, right? But we know that PI and P final must be equal to each other because the momentum is constant. And if you equate them, m v zero equal to two m v final, and you will find that the v final is equal to v zero divided by two. It's half of the initial velocity of the one of the volumes. Okay, if the masses are the same. All right, uh, let me raise this thing or because this concerns another question. So we have two objects, okay, two blocks A and B. They collide to each other and they stick to each other. Compared to before the collision, the system of two objects after the collision has the same total momentum and the same total kinetic energy. The same uh, total momentum but less total kinetic energy. Less total momentum but the same total kinetic energy. The less total momentum, the less total kinetic energy. And e, not enough information. What do you say?
Okay, what do you think? They collide, they stick together, okay? They move together after the collision. We don't know uh, their specific velocities. We don't know their specific masses. We know nothing specific values about their uh, masses and velocities. And in this case, can you tell that after the collision, the total momentum will be the same, the different? And what can you say about the total momentum after the collision? The same. That one thing that we know for sure, right? There are no external forces on them. The only forces are because of their collision, their internal forces. But that we know that these forces, when you sum, will be equal to zero. Because one, one of the force that applies to on the other will be exactly the same force on the other one. If you to, uh, make a total of the sum, you will get zero. So the total momentum is zero. Uh, mo total momentum is conserved, right? That's we know. What can you tell about their kinetic energies? Why? Is kinetic energy conserved during a in completely inelastic collision or <coughs> in an inelastic collision? No? Uh, well, if no, will the final kinetic energy less or larger than the initial kinetic energy in this specific case? In this specific case, that two objects, they stick and they move together. Why do we have a less total kinetic energy after the collision? Well, it's not safe. Right? But we don't know if we need to make the goal. We don't care. Why? Well, in fact, the kinetic energy is the kinetic energy is do not depend on direction, right? The can, does the kinetic energy de depends on the direction of the velocity? No, it does not depend on the direction of the velocity. There is no any mass loss of mass during the collision. Uh, imagine the masses are the same. Total mass is the same. That. Well, obviously, the velocities are changing, but the total of the kinetic energy does change. You said it changes, it will be less kinetic energy? But why? If it is a less kinetic energy, if it's, if it's a less kinetic energy after the collision, then you can ask. Initial total energy is in terms of kinetic energy, right? And the final total energy is less than the initial kinetic energy, less than the uh, initial energy. Where does this difference go in the energy? Since they stick, some of the energy is consumed, some of the energy is consume, consumed in the process of gluing these two objects together. That's a chemical process, but we don't know the details about the chemistry of this uh, sticking. But one thing we, we know that this sticking process some must somehow consume some energy. And this less kinetic energy after the collision, uh, this amount of uh, uh, consumed uh, energy in, in, uh, in compared to the previous case, must be consumed in this sticking, right? Well, <coughs> One thing we know now with this example that all kinds of collisions conserve momentum, but only in one of the collision, which is completely elastic collision, also conserves the kinetic energies. The kinetic energy do not conserve, the kinetic energies are not conserved in the inelastic collisions. Okay? In the inelastic collisions, the kinetic energy is not Conserve. The only conserved quantity for all kinds of collisions is the momentum. The momentum is conserved. The kinetic energy is conserved that we will see this. The kinetic energy is also conserved only in the case of completely elastic collisions.
that we will see. Okay, so now let's think an object, okay, which has initially a mass. This is a different question, okay? Let me, uh, uh, okay. Oops. <coughs> okay, think about this scenario. We have a large object. which is mass M. Let's call this a bomb. Breathe new, Suzakashar. Let's, you have a bomb, okay? A bombshell. And initially it's at rest. And it explodes, okay? It explodes uh, at some time, and it crashes into two pieces. I'm just drawing the time of the explosion. And one piece after the explosion goes in one direction. The other piece goes in the other direction. Okay. Well, you don't know the final velocities of the two pieces. One piece is divided into two pieces after the uh, uh, explosion. And let's call one of the pieces as mass M1, the other piece as M2. And these two masses, M1 and M2, are sum to equal to large mass M. What happens the kinetic energy before and after explosion? Does it increase, does it decrease, or stays the same? Okay, we have one large mass, and it explodes. Okay, it explodes, explodes. After the explosion, the mass, initial mass, is divided into two pieces, and they have totally the same mass with that of the initial one. M1, M1 plus M2 is equal to the uh, capital M. So since after the explosion, two masses move with some non-zero velocities, right? They have some kinetic energy, right? Is that this total kinetic energy after the explosion is the same with the initial kinetic energy or larger or smaller? Well, do we have a kinetic energy before the explosion? <laughs> we don't have any kinetic energy before the explosion. We have, in fact, a zero kinetic energy before the explosion. But after the explosion, obviously, we have some kind of kinetic energy because the objects are moving with some non-zero velocities. So where does this kinetic energy come from then? And this comes from the chemical reaction of the explosion. We don't know nothing about this uh, chemical reaction, but obviously, since there is an explosion, these pieces are moving with some uh, non-zero velocities, and this energy is coming from the chemical reaction of the explosion. But one thing for sure we know, that these pieces, if you sum, the momentum of these pieces, it will be equal to zero, right? Because initial momentum, which is zero, because one large piece stays at rest, zero, and the final momentum, this motion of these pieces, moving in different directions, moving in opposite directions, in fact, some of the momentum is zero. Some of the momentum of 
these pieces after the collision, after the explosion, is equal to zero. That you can easily, immediately say that these pieces in total have a zero moment. Okay? So, you know, there are two cases that in the completely inelastic collision that the total kinetic, uh, the kinetic energy may either decrease or increase. Both ways are possible. In inelastic collisions, the kinetic energy before the collision or after the collision may either decrease or increase. Both ways are possible. We have a nice example of finding the velocities of bullets from a gun, okay? And this is called the ballistic pendulum, okay? Ballistics, ballistics report. Most of the time you're hearing this word ballistic in movies, right? What is the ballistic? Ballistic is the science of analyzing, analyzing uh, the motion of bullets and guns, right? Anyway, this is a very uh, uh, sophisticated science, uh, especially used by the Department of uh, Police uh, to find uh, the specific properties of bullets in the crime scene. What they do is they do ballistic anal uh, analyzing, uh, analyzing the uh, bullets ballistically. But this ballistic pendulum is this. We have a pendulum, this stick, and at the end of the stick, we have a large mass, very large mass, okay? And this stick, this is a, a, a solid, uh, solid uh, rod, is free to move around this pivot point A, okay? It's moving like this, right? Freely around this point. A pivot point. What we do is we shot this block M by a gun. And our aim is to find the velocity of the bullet. How can we find it? How can you find the velocity of the bullet? Because it moves very fast. And you don't have any uh, motion picture camera, nothing. Okay? You only have this pendulum that's it what you uh, observe after shutting this mass attached to the end of a rod this uh, pendulum it moves at a certain distance right it moves a certain height from its uh, initial uh, position right and it moves a certain height and it stops there at this maximum height that you can measure right you can measure easily you can measure this, uh, that what you will do today in the experiment. For those of you who have done the experiment last week, kimler yaptı deneyi geçen hafta? Bunu yaptık değil mi geçen hafta? So uh, there is a very uh, uh, easy way to determine the height of this pendulum that you will see today in the lab. Okay, this is easily measure just by measuring this distance listen me carefully just by measuring this distance you can determine the speed of this bullet how okay so one thing we know that the collision of the bullet and this large mass block is a completely inelastic collision right because the bullet goes into the block and stays there. And after this collision, of course, because of the impact of the bullet, or the impulse, what you say, on the block, this bullet and block system together uh, move certain height, right? And uh, this height is provided by the initial kinetic energy of these two, right? Because after the collision, the large mass and the bullock will have some certain kinetic energy at the bottom, but we don't know their final velocities just before, uh, just after the hitting. Uh, this we can also find it. 
we can find this velocity by invoking the conservation of momentum, right? So, with this initial kinetic energy at the bottom, this system will go a certain height so that this kinetic energy, initial kinetic energy, is converted to final potential energy of the bullock and bullock system. So just by measuring this. Let's do this one by one, okay? Let's analyze the case where the bullet initially going with some certain initial velocity V0 and the block stays at rest. Right just after the collision, the, uh, the point B, the blood, the, the bullet and the block moves a certain velocity, at a certain velocity, which is called VB, okay? And at C, the bullet and block system stops at certain height with having a certain maximum uh, potential energy. So we will analyze these situations in A, B, and C. I can write down the total momentum in part A. The total momentum is only provided by the bullet because only moving object is the bullet. The M stays at rest, it has no momentum. So the initial momentum of the system is the mass of the bullet times its in, uh, velocity V0. So this is the total momentum, okay? This total momentum must be equal to the momentum of two objects. When the bullet goes into the block and it sticks, stays there, and they move with some velocity VB, okay? Well, at this point, they have the same momentum, both block and the bullet. No. They have the same velocity because they stick together. Their masses now is the sum of their uh, block and the uh, bullet mass, right? So since they are moving this with the same velocity, I can write down the final momentum of these two, right, in this case small m plus large m times vb. But since the momentum is conserved, I can equate pa to pb because the momentum is this, uh, conserved. Momentum is conserved and pa is equal to pb. And I can express the final velocity of the bullet and block system, vb, in terms of the initial velocity of the bullet. But still, I don't know what the v0 is, okay? My aim is to find V0. And small m is the mass of the uh, bullet and the large m is the mass of the block. Now concentrate on the point C. Okay? On point C, the system has zero kinetic energy. Okay? From this point to C, from B to C, I will use another conservation law, which is the conservation of energy. I don't need to use uh, the conservation of momentum anymore because I already used this in expressing Vb in terms of V0. Now, I will use the conservation of energy between point B and C. And I know that at point B, the system acts like one object having a mass m plus m, small m plus large m, and since they have the same velocity vb, so this has an initial kinetic energy of one half small m plus large m times vb square. This kinetic energy must be equal to the potential energy at this position, right? The potential energy at this position is nothing but the small mass plus the large mass times G times H, right? This is the final energy of the system and this potential energy must be equal to the kinetic energy at here. So from this, I can express the square of VB as 2G times H and 
this is equal to in terms of in terms of the initial velocity of the bullet and the masses of the bullet and the block. So Vb square is equal to 2gh. This is coming from the conservation of energy. But on the other hand, I already expressed Vb, right? Vb in terms of V0 and the masses. So I will write in instead of Vb this expression squared small m divided by small m plus large m times v0 square. And this expression is equal to 2 times g times h. Okay? h is the final height of the bullet and block system. This is. So I can now express v0 in terms of the small mass, the mass of the bullet, the mass of the block times in the square root g, the gravitational constant, times h. So as you see, the velocity of the bullet is expressed in terms of g, h, and the masses. Okay? So that by just by measuring the height, h, and by just uh, f uh, using the mass of the bullet and the block, I can find the velocity of the initial velocity of the bullet. Well, usually the mass of the bullet is much, much less than the mass of the block. Okay? So in this ratio, small mass plus large mass, m, we can ignore this small s because it is a very small quantity in compared to the large mass. Our final expression for V0 is, this in square 2gh, the mass of the block, large mass, divided by the mass of the bullet. Okay, if the mass of the bullet is much, much less than the mass of the block. So this is the ballistic pendulum, and this is how we measure the velocities of the bullets shot from a gun. This is you, you will uh, do the experiment today in the lab. And for those of you who have done in last week. So I, I will finish today's lecture with one simple uh, question that we have a block A has a mass of 1 kilograms and a block B has a mass of 3 kilograms and two blocks collide and they stick together right? they stick together on a level frictionless surface there is no friction they stick together and they move together after the collision what is the kinetic energy of the block A in terms of the kinetic energy of the block B? I don't know the initial final uh, velocities and I am asking the question that if block A has a kinetic energy, what is this kinetic energy in terms of the kinetic energy of block B? Three times. There is even no any answer on this. Oh yes, there is an E. The same energy, kinetic energy. But this is not the right answer. Do they have the same velocity after the collision? Do they have the same velocity after the collision? So if the kinetic energy of A after the collision is, let's say, KEA, one half MA, right? V final square. And let's write down the kinetic energy of B. One half. What is the mass of B? In terms of the mass of A, 
This three, M A, right? What about the final velocity of B? It's the same. So this is nothing but three times the kinetic energy of A. It's one over three, yes. Sorry about Okay. So the kinetic energy of A is one third of the kinetic energy of B. Okay, so I stop here. Um, today we have a lab. <laughs>